And 17. And on the second day, you shall offer 12 young bullocks, two rams, 14 lambs of the first year without spot. Amen. So, so you offering rams up in the house? <laughs> um, I hope y'all are excited. This message right here really blessed me. And this morning, I'm just so full of God this morning, man. I just I just love him. And I just want to share that with, the, with, with God's people. He is such an awesome God. I don't know if y'all can tell, but I probably ain't never stood up here so feeling so excited uh, before y'all before. Normally I have this real solemn, serious look on my face. <laughs> but this message right here is really to encourage the body of Christ and, and, and really make it relative for us. And um, if you uh, don't mind standing, please, as we reverence the word of God. You're not standing for me, but you're standing for God. Please go over with me to Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 4. And then we're going to go to Matthew 16, 24 through 26. If you was here last Sunday, those are the same scriptures we went over last Sunday. Last Sunday was about what will a man give for his own life and what are the consequences. This message that God gave me to, for today is going to merge with that one. So if you really want the whole piece of it, you got to go back to uh, what we talked about last Sunday. Please say amen when you're there. I'm, Genesis 12, 1 through 4. <clears throat> I'm reading. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. He's telling Abraham, I want you to get out of this environment, because I want to take you to a new environment a more prosperous and better environment. I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that cursed thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. By this one man's obedience, the whole, whole earth shall be blessed. So Abram departed. That means he was obedient to the voice of God. As the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him, and Abram was seventy and five years old when he departed out of Haran. Go with me over to Matthew 16, 24 through 26. Please say amen when you're there. I think I got one, maybe two. Matthew 16, verses 24 through 26. I'm reading. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. And whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? I'm praying. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning in the name of Jesus. Father, we humble ourselves, O oh God, to your voice, to your authority, O oh God, and to your spirit, Father. As this word come forth, O oh God, ask and pray that it come forth with conviction, O oh God, power and demonstration of the Holy Ghost, O oh God. And we ask and pray, Father, that your will be done on today. Anoint me afresh, O oh God, that I only speak the very things you would have me to speak, no more, no less. Hide me behind the cross, O oh God, in the name of Jesus, that your people see and hear you and not me. And God, we thank you. We give your name the honor, the glory, and the praise. And the church said, in the name of Jesus, you may be seated. I am truly, truly excited. This message right here is unique to me. I've never preached like this before. I've never felt God like this before. And you know what God told me this morning? He said, come from behind the pulpit and relate to my people. He wants us to be equal across the board. Sometimes we stand behind this pulpit and it puffs us up. It makes us feel like we're, we're better or we're higher than someone. And God said, I want you to come get on their level. I want you to be able to relate to them. God told me that he was going to use me to relate to people right where they are. And that he wanted me to illustrate his word to them in a way that it was plain for them to understand. If you go to Habakkuk 2 and 2, says write the vision and make it plain. Write it upon the tables. 
What tables is he talking about? The tables of your heart. A lot of people like to get dressed up when they got some sort of event to. And today God told me, don't put on no suit. He said, I want you to relate to your people. Sometimes we get so focused on the suit that we forget to look at the fruit of people's lives. The suit don't make a preacher. I'm anointed to do this. I'm called to do this by God, not man. God told me I'm going to use you in a unique way. And I want you to be comfortable when you do it. So this message right here is unique. And one reason why is this message is going to give y'all an insight to where I came from. Me. How many times do we come to church and we hear about Job? We hear about King David. We hear about Paul and Peter. But we don't really hear about the preacher that's preaching. What has he been through? What has he endured for the name of Jesus Christ? And where is the blessings of God in his life? Because they don't want to talk about it. They don't want, they don't want you to know the sins that they've been in. So this right here is going to let you in to my life and my walk with God. God said, and make it plain. He told me don't sugarcoat nothing. He said, I want you to be transparent so that they can see right through you. And that's exactly what I'm going to do this morning. The topic I'm going to be preaching from this morning is called a product of your environment. Last night, I was scroll I was on my computer to print off this message after I had kind of reviewed it and everything. And at the last minute, I decided to go log into my school account to see my grades. And there's a main screen that pops up. I always ask God, confirm your message to me before I preach to your people. Because I want them to know that it's you and not me. I, I clicked on it. I logged in. I clicked on this link. And immediately, this guy was talking about how on his job, he was trying to focus more so he could be a product of his environment. Look at God. God will always confirm his word to you. He will always confirm to you who you are. Stop letting people dictate to you and your environment dictate to you who you are and what you're going to be. Amen. How many of us have been told we'll never be nothing? We'll never be nobody. We'll never have nothing. We'll never accomplish anything great in our life. How many of us have heard it? Almost everybody's heard it. I don't care if you grew up rich or poor, you've probably heard it more than likely. Because even a lot of poor parents tell their kids, this is it. This is your life. You can't put that on that child. You don't know what God is going to do with that child. That's what this message is really about. Stop being a product of your environment and become a product of the environment of God. If you go back to Abraham, he was telling Abraham, I don't want you to be a product of your family. I want to take you somewhere new so I can make you someone new because that's not what I called you to. And some of us can't let go of our past. And we still mad with God because we can't get to our future. Everybody in here that has a, has a gift no call. And everybody that first gives their life to Christ, he will begin to show you bits and pieces of who you really are. And a lot of us walk in doubt and we don't believe it because we can't see it. If we could see it, then we don't, we don't have to have faith. It says hope that is seen ain't hope. You don't have to have hope for something that's right there in front of you. But you do have to have faith to continue to walk in what God is showing you. And God told me, he said, I'm going to use you to preach and teach against popular belief in the world. Everything that I'm going to preach and teach is going to go against popular belief. Watch. Because God said. And if you go into his word, he never is in agreement with the world systems. Never. He will never have you walking according to the world. I want to show you all something. Because last Sunday I said something and I misquoted it and I want to go back and correct that. But there's something in there. Go with me to Revelations chapter 12, verse 11. And then we're going to hop back over to Revelations chapter 1. I'm sorry, Revelations 12 and 11. I'm sorry. How many of us are aware that evil is real and Satan is real? Do we believe that? No. I mean, look at people. I mean, people are killing each other over $5. Mm -hmm. 
ten dollars. You ate my my last bit of cereal. There's so much going on. My wife showed me something this morning about a 26 year old uh, guy. His last name was Chow. I don't know what his ethnic background was, but I know he was from Washington State. He went to this uh, country. Um, I forget the name of it, but I know the people were called Singalese. This tribe has been cut off from the world. They are stuck in that time. And he went there to spread Christianity, and they killed him. How many of us are sacrificing our lives like that to spread the gospel? How many of us are so focused on what we're going to look like to people, and it causes us to walk in fear? It causes us to not live up to what God has said we're going to be. How many? This, this, he was only 26 year old. And he sacrificed his life so that they might come to know the name of Jesus Christ. They are so uh, protective of their civilization that they don't allow no outsiders in. And even the cops can't go in because they're going to try to kill you. Because they don't want nothing to do with the outside world. But I decree and declare that the word of God is going to reach every corner of the earth. I don't care how secluded it is. And some of us may be apt to go take it. Are you willing? And this is for Periscope. You on YouTube. Are you willing? Are you willing to lay down your life for those that don't know Christ? But they might kill you because they don't agree with you. Or they don't want to hear the truth. They think their way is right. But Proverbs 14 and 12 says there's a way that seemeth right to a man that leadeth to a path of destruction. This guy was, was so focused on them getting the word of God that he told, he had wrote a 13 page letter. And in the end of it, he said, do not try to find my body if they kill me because their souls are at stake. How many of us are more concerned about the souls of those around us instead of our own desires and our own will? Because we feel like, well, this is my life. It's the only life that's given to me, so I'm going to do with it what I want. That's what a lot of us choose to do. But we can't live like that and call ourselves Christians. As I um, begin to go through this message, because there's a lot in here, man. I'm, I'm so full this morning. I'm trying not to get ahead of myself. Um, but last week, I was thinking of this scripture, Revelations 12 and 11. And they overcame him, they who? Saints. Put your name there if you call yourself a saint. That means I overcame him, overcame evil, overcame Satan, everything that he's sending to tempt me with, the adversity that I faced. I overcame it by the blood of the Lamb, the precious blood of Jesus Christ, and by the word of their testimony. Whose testimony? Our testimony, not just the testimonies of the men and women of the Bible. How many of you know that if you are a saint and you gave your life to Christ, that you are a man or woman of the Bible? We are called to be walking epistles of God. We are letters. Just imagine us being put in a mailbox to be sent to a country or to a community that don't know nothing about God. They don't want nothing to do with God. But God says, go, because I need you to preach my word to them. Because when they stand before me, they won't have an excuse to say, well, I never heard it. I don't know who you are. God ain't leaving no room for excuses in these last days. I promise you he's not. I'm not telling you something I don't know and I haven't experienced. He says, and they loved not their lives unto death. This 26-year-old did not love his life so much that he wasn't willing to give it up for God. How many of us are willing to die for God? That time is coming. People are being killed because they're Christian. I want y'all to understand something. Don't let nobody make you believe that what we're doing here is just a belief system. It's just something you believe. Don't put your beliefs on me. This ain't a belief. This is a lifestyle. This is truth. I'm not trying to give you what I think and what I believe. I'm trying to give you truth so it'll save your life. That's what I'm doing. We got to get to the point that we don't love our lives so much that we forsake our gifts and our calling. And we cannot just operate out of our gifts. We got to walk in the calling that God has called us to. I refuse to chase after a music ministry and I can't play no instruments, but it's something I want to do. 
He didn't call me to do that. So why would I put my hands to something he didn't call me to? Because all I'm going to do is mess it up. I'm going to cause people to stumble in the kingdom of God. And God says, woe unto them who causes one of my little ones to stumble. You better not offend one of God's children. Not intentionally. We're going to offend each other unintentionally. But I'm talking about intentional. We're talking about willful sin and intentional sin and intentional wrong and willful wrong. You know what you're doing and you do it anyway. That's what God is focused on. He ain't talking about what you do unwillfully. That's out of your control, obviously. That's why it's called unwillful. So we got to learn how to get real. And God said, that's why I want you to come from behind the pulpit in time. Get real with my people. We need real men and women of God up here that are appointed and anointed by God to do this. Not someone who chooses to do it because they want a salary or they want God to, to, to pay all their bills. God don't work that way. And if you say he does, I'll call you a liar. And God says a liar shall not tarry in my sight. We got to stop associating ourselves with people that don't want what we have. All they're going to do is exhaust you and drain the life out of you. They're pulling from you and then they throw it away. Last week I said it was by the word of God and the blood of the testimony. And I want to go back and correct that. It's by the blood of the lamb and the word of the testimony. But I knew what I was talking about. I want y'all to know that. Up above that in verse 9 it says, The devil and Satan which deceiveth the whole world. How many of you know that that's his chief mission? That's his chief goal. To deceive. His ultimate goal is to deceive you. Keep that in mind. Go with me over to Revelation chapter 1. In Revelation chapter 1, it begins to talk about this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. It does not say the revelation of Jeremy Locklear. It does not say the revelation of preacher so-and-so. So that tells me right there, I can't get up here and give you my opinion and give you what my flesh thinks. I need to give you the word of God. And I need to give you the revelation he gives me of that word. And to show it to you, I'm going to keep reading it which God gave unto him, who? Jesus Christ, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. That means things are about to happen. Things have already been happening. But are you prepared for what's about to happen? Because God always talks from the future. So this message is about what you're about to encounter. You ain't encountered it yet. It says, and he sent and signified it, which means to announce and make note of by his angel unto his servant, John. John was one that was told to bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Guess what we're called to do? The same thing. It says the book, talking about the book of Revelations, was transmitted from God to Christ to the angel, to John, to the churches, to us today. I found out that the Bible never stops. It's progressive. Even though these are the only pages we have, guess what? God is still writing. He's still writing to this day in us. It's up to us to carry those letters to wherever God is telling us to go, to minister to whoever he's telling us to minister to. There's a lot of people contemplating suicide in these last days. There's a lot of people come into contact with adversity and they want to give up. They turn to pills. They turn to drugs. They turn to sex. And God says enough is enough. The real, y'all heard that song by Eminem? Will the real Slim Shady please stand up? God is saying, will the real Christians please stand up? I'm tired of asking. I'm tired of begging and pleading with my church. Stop inviting the world in. Because you can't help the world if you're over here playing with them. Amen. And that's what a lot of churches are doing. They're playing with people's souls. So if, if God gave the word to Christ, then to the angel, and to John, to the churches, and to us, you think God can't talk to us today one-on-one? -on -one? You think the Holy Spirit ain't doing his job? Because he's talking, man. He's been talking so much. I got no notes all over this that I probably ain't going to be able to get to. But I'm not going to rush it. I'm, I'm here to just be led by him. 
and say what I, what he needs to say. Not what I need to say, but what he wants to say. It's all about being led by the Spirit of God. And we can't do that if we're consumed with everything else. We're so busy chasing our lives. But I just read the scripture in Matthew 16. Any man that seeks his life is going to lose it. We are living, breathing souls. Can we at least agree on that much? We have a soul. And it's in trouble. It's in danger of hell and judgment of God. We don't know why we're losing people in our lives. We don't know why we're losing stuff. I'm going to show it to you. Why? And it's because we're not truly committed to the things of God. We're not really seeking the face of God. We're seeking what we want. And God says he's tired of it. This book is a book of prophecies. And I want to read something here. Seven times in Revelation indicating the prophetic aspect of the book. Verse 3 says, Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. The time for what? It's time for Christ to return for his church, for his people. I want us to understand he's not, the body of Christ is not the bride. Of Christ. The holy city, the new Jerusalem, which will descend from heaven, is the bride. But a kingdom without no citizens ain't a kingdom. We are to be a part of that kingdom. Do you think his kingdom don't have rules and regulations and boundaries? So why do we think that we can just cut off moral law and live any kind of way? Because it's not going to be so when his kingdom comes. That's the time he's talking about. The 144,000, the Jews, the Gentiles that have given their life to Christ. We will be a part of that kingdom. And what he's doing is he's trying to tell you, stop being a product of this environment, this world, because I'm trying to teach you how to be a product of the kingdom to come. It's a different type of environment. If we don't learn how to live holy now, we're not going to be able to be in it later because it's a holy city. It's a new city. Look at what man has been doing time and time again. Man is trying to create a utopia, a perfect society. It'll never happen on this side. Never going to happen. But they keep trying to come out with new technologies because they think they can fix everything. This earth will not be fixed. It says this earth, this earth and this heaven will pass away. Did it not? The atmosphere is somewhere in the scripture. I forget where it's at. But it talks about being burned up, even the atmosphere, with fervent heat. He destroyed the earth before with a flood. This time it's going to be fire. Now, if you're in God, you can't die. Even if you die on this side, the only thing dying is your body. But everything else will be translated over to live with God in eternity. And you'll never see death again. Death has no sting to us as Christians. Why are we so worried about it? Why do we get so caught up in it? It's just a transitioning from one place to the next. To be absent from the body on this side means to be present with the Lord. If you're a saint, sinners are not going to heaven. Backsliders are not going to heaven. Liars, cheaters, whoremongers, not going to heaven. To them that know what to do good and don't do it, to them it is sin. You're a sinner. You're not going to heaven. I don't care if you profess Christianity. I don't, I don't care if you talk about the word. I don't care if you're casting demons out. You're not living it. You're not going to heaven. That's what it means to be born again. I'm walking the word of God. Period. There ain't no comma. There's nothing after that. I'm going to walk it the way God tells me to walk it and nothing else. Stop getting so caught up in what's going on in this life because it's irrelevant to your salvation. Stop depending on people to get you where you need to go. Seek God. Seek God. I don't care what it is you need or what it is you're looking for or how bad you think your life is. Seek God. I wasn't raised with a gold spoon in my mouth. I grew up in poverty. And I'm still seeking God. 
Because it ain't about stuff. It, he says, him that winneth souls is wise. This is for the kingdom of God. It's not for my benefit. He tells John to write unto the seven churches which are in Asia because they were doing all these things, all these things, all these religious things, all these ceremonials and rituals, trying to keep the things of God. And God was not pleased with it because some of them started letting the world in. Some of them started burdening the people by the word. That's not what a leader is supposed to do. We're supposed to feed you and give you nourishment. And that's not what they were doing. And some of them had got so deep and involved in church that it says they forgot their first love, which was Jesus Christ. They forgot about loving people. I don't have to get up here and preach in no suit. I'm preaching in Jordans. It don't matter. The word is still going to come forth. God is still God. It's not about what you're wearing. It's about what you're carrying on the inside. Anger, resentment, frustration, lust, envy, lasciviousness, backbiting, whoring, idolatry, all of the above will be cast into the lake of fire. So it's time for us to do a self inventory. Where am I at in God? Because you might not be where you think you are. It says in the scriptures, you think you have salvation. Just because I studied the word, don't make me a Christian. I know I've met demons that know the word better than I did. But I knew that they were false Amen. because I had discernment. God don't let his people get caught off guard. Amen. Some of us are getting caught off guard by what happens around us because we're not in his word. Look over the past week. If you could calculate how much time did you spend in his word? I'm talking about really. I'm talking about quality. Focusing on God, what are you saying to me? I dare you to try it. Give God that quality time. I want to read something. This is notes I had before I got into doing this. It says transitioning and then the preparation for it. Transitioning means a passing from one condition or environment to another. It also means transformation and realignment with the things of God. This means getting back to the things of God and revealing the true nature of the church and the purpose of the body of Christ. Go back to Acts chapter 1 and 2 and even Exodus. It shows the true nature of God can only be revealed to a true church. It don't matter if it's a ministry, disciple, you have to be true and pure for God to reveal who he really is to you. That was the whole point of this morning about Ask yourself, am I being genuine with God? Am I really asking him sincerely to show me who he really is? Amen. The churches of today only masquerade around as forms of godliness. Their wolves in sheep's clothing, etc. Only pretending to know God, but underneath they are no better than Ramses, who was the Pharaoh of Egypt. No better than he is. They, <clears throat> they use only devices of Satan to allure you. That means to tempt you with something desirable, attract, entice you, and then they force you to make, make brick with no straw. That's what he did. He would give the Hebrews a little sprinkle over here of something good to keep them slaving for his agenda. That's exactly what Satan is doing in the spirit to some of us. He trickles little good things around us, and then we turn around and put God's name on it. Look at God, forging his name. And then six months down the road, you lose it. Was it still God? Or what did it? The enemy can help you get stuff. But it's about seeking God so that you don't be deceived. There's some, somewhere in the scriptures it talks about even the very elect of God. That's th those who are chosen by God specifically for a specific assignment. Even they will be deceived if they're not careful. So how much can we walk around drunk with the lust and things of this world and not end up in heaven. It says, the, it says the righteous are scarcely entering into heaven. That's the righteous. It says the righteous man will fall seven times in a day. But the hand of the Lord reaches down to lift him back up. Not, it didn't say a person. There's plenty of times I've had to go through stuff alone. 
Jesus Christ bore his cross alone, except for that short period where Simeon helped him carry his cross. It's okay to ask for help here and there. Not here, 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 I'm there, and I'm still asking. Get rid of all your crutches. God is tired of us leaning on people because all all they're doing is making us capable of still asking for help. What about asking God for help? You're scared to ask God. You know why? Because he might not give you what you want. He might not put you on the path that you want to be on. Then what? Where is your faith then? They entice you with empty promises of prosperous futures after tremendous debts of education, fluffed up teachings and doctrines, and you end up working tirelessly with the illusion of prosperity and financial freedom, paying off debts, sleepless nights, constant oppression, etc., and yet you're no better off than the Hebrews who were slaves to Egypt. You got look around at the millennials, man. They're in 50, 60, $100,000 worth of debt chasing the education, and they'll never get out of it. It's just an illusion. I promise you it is. There's not many of them actually become successful. There's not many. And if they did, some of them were selling their souls to do it. Because they start, Satan starts telling them, hey, you got to do whatever you got to do to be successful in this world. I, I don't care if you got to sell your child. Into, people are get, selling their children into trafficking. Look it up. I'm not telling you something. I haven't looked up. There's so much craziness going on in the world. And people are doing it for drugs. They're doing it for money, for prosperity, for a title. What if what if you are going to be put in a situation where you have to lose everything you got? You still going to trust God? Because we say we will. I want you to really, really inventory your heart and see if it's really true. Because it's going to come. That time is coming. And it's because the enemy is going to come in, just like he do some of these churches. He comes in and says, well, because you're getting help from us, you got to do this. And it's not going to line up with the word of God. And now you're going to be compromising. I refuse to compromise. I don't care if you don't like me. I don't care if you call me friend. I don't care. I'm not going to hell for you or anybody else. I know what God is telling me. So we got to all make that choice as individuals. I'm not going to hell for people and nobody. I'm going to do what God called me to do. So now to the message. (laughs) Because that was just the intro. I'm going to be reading a little bit of this, but for the most part, it's just a, a life testimony. Around around the time of like 2007, I met Pastor December of 2006, 2005. I got saved around June or July of 2006. That's when I really started hearing truth. I had been to churches before. I wasn't raised in the church, but I had visited. You know, people ask. You go. You might go to the altar, give your life to Christ, but you don't know what you're doing. You know why? Because they're not teaching you. They're not explaining to you what it's going to cost. All they tell you is what you want to hear. You know why? So you'll keep coming back. So they can put numbers in the church. I don't care if there was just one of y'all here today. I'm going to still preach. Because wherever truth is being preached, the crowd thins out. Go to Acts chapter 1. There was 500. By the time they got done, there was 120 left. 380 went to do whatever they wanted to do. They weren't willing to sacrifice. That's how I know that majority of the world is on its way to hell. Tell me what you want. This ain't a belief system. This ain't Jeremy's religion. This is God. We got to stop looking at who's up here preaching and teaching as a man and start listening for the voice of God. We got to see God in these messages, man, because he's talking. We just ain't listening. So around that time, around the towards the end of 2007, it was one of the roughest times of my life. My dad got shot in the head, became disabled. I had to go pray for him. It was rough. Not long after that, I come home. I was working on Fort Bragg, but I lived in Lumberton. I came home one day, and my front door was kicked in. Somebody had broken into my house. Now, at the time, I was professing Christianity. When I went to work, I took my Bible. I read scriptures, and I would come to church. But I want to show you what was really in my heart. 
And that's what God told me to do. So, of course, I go in. The cops are there. I am angry. I'm upset. I feel violated. I'm talking about I had, I had Jordans that nobody else around Lumberton had. I had a nice car. I had a nice sound system. Nice house. I was single. Could kind of do what I wanted to do to a limit. Or so I thought. And in my mind, in my mind now, not my heart, my mind, I'm thinking I'm saved. I'm thinking I'm doing what's right. So now I feel some type of way towards God. Why did you let this happen to me? I'm out here sacrificing because I would have to drive from Lumberton to come to church up here. That building right there. So that was on a Tuesday. So I decided with my smart self, I'm going to leave my car parked at my sister's. I'm going to stay home all day Wednesday to see if they come back because I had a little bit of stuff left. Wasn't much. They took all my Nikes, the Jordans, the Timberlands. They took my video games. They took my computer. Expensive stuff. I didn't have cheap stuff, but at the same time, I didn't even make a lot of money. So I don't know how I had it. So I stay home Wednesday. Nothing happens. Thursday morning, I go come back to work. I get back home that Thursday evening. Guess what? Now my back door is open. They come back. You talking about really angry? Has any of y'all ever seen that movie Walking Tall with The Rock where he's talking around that four by four? I had an axe handle that my dad had gave me. I was walking up and down the neighborhood, man, screaming, yelling. I probably cussed, called myself a Christian, but I, I, couldn't, I, couldn't, I, I, I couldn't endure it. And now I'm even more angry with God. Immediately that same day, twice in one week, man, my house has been broken into. Imagine how fearful I was because I didn't have no gun. I didn't know if they had planned on coming back and finishing me off or what they were going to do. I started packing and I made I called a friend of mine. Her and her grandma, they stayed up here in Fairville. They said, come stay with us. I was like, okay. I go stay with them. So now I'm talking to pastor about what my situation is. Guess what he tells me? Did you seek God? He said, do you really think that's a wise choice, staying with two women? You really think I want to sleep with a grandma? So I'm, I'm looking at pastor like, really, bro? Like, are you serious? My dad's been shot. I've been trying to go help them. And now my house gets broken into. Like, I'm in all kind of emotional turmoil at this point. And pastor didn't care. He looked right through it. And he saw that I was basing everything off of my emotions and what I thought was right. But at the time, I was so upset and angry with him, I could not hear it. It caused me to leave the church. For about a year and a half, I went back to trying to find my life. I went back to try to find the things I wanted in life and pursue the goals that I had without this. I didn't want this. I could not be up under a man who couldn't sympathize with me. What I was really looking was for him to make an excuse for just say, it's okay. You're okay. It wasn't because I stayed with these women, because me and that girl were never intimate. We just always been friends. It, it weren't nothing like that. But it was because he was looking at, well, what if someone else sees you and you call yourself a Christian, what would they think? They might think you're shacking, that you're fornicating. And the problem was this, is even though I was single, it's hard being alone. I'm telling you, man, loneliness will get the best of you. And it will make you say things like, I'm just looking for love. I'm just looking for my spouse. So you start dating. I had a house to myself. So you know that occasionally I had women coming over. One thing always led to another. But in my mind, it's okay. God knows I'm, I'm lonely. God knows I'm hurt. God knows that I got abused when I was at home, verbally, emotionally. My dad was an alcoholic. He knows I had a bad childhood. He knows I'm a good guy. He knows my, 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 my heart is in the right place. I want to get married. I don't want to be alone the rest of my life. He's okay with that. And pastor would not agree with me. He wouldn't. I'm talking about I would be in tears, man. He wouldn't agree with me. And now I'm grateful for it because I see why he done it. Because if he would have made an excuse for me, for one, he's in trouble with God. My blood would have been on his hands if something happened to me. The pastor wasn't happy. And two, 
He realized that God was trying to take me out of being a product of my environment and put me in a new environment. Put me in his atmosphere, which is love, peace, joy, comfort, gentleness, meekness. He even gives you discernment to where you can see into the future. You can see things happening before they happen. He's a protector. He's a refuge in times of trouble. He's a strong tower. And so many people, they go through stuff like that, and instead of running to God, they run back to the world for help. I look back on it now, and believe it or not, I'm just now realizing what was going on back then. At the time that it happened, I thought I was so in tune with myself. I thought I was so in tune with God, and I knew what was going on. I thought I knew me better than Pastor did. Believe it or not, you can really not know yourself and come into contact with a man or woman of God, and they can tell you exactly what's going on with you. But you're not going to believe it because you can't see it. And you don't want to hear it because it's not going to line up with your wants and your desires. That was a tough time for me, man. I was losing jobs. I would get, I'm talking about, I'm talking about they walk up, give me a pink slip, you're laid off. At a moment's notice. So now I'm stressed about losing a place to stay. I ended up staying in a condemned place. And pastor didn't just call me every day to check on me. He didn't come by, just stop by. He didn't do it. He left me alone with God. And I had to accept it. And I'm talking about I was angry with that man. But now that I'm in this new environment, I'm grateful. I have peace. I have joy. I have more naturally now than I've ever had. There's things I got right now i never seen myself have. I just got news that legally I can never work again. And my bills is paid. Hallelujah. Don't tell me what God can't do. I've been sitting back and watching him bless me even when I didn't deserve it. But he wouldn't do it until I was serious about his work. He told me a long time ago, if you take care of my business, I will take care of yours. And I didn't believe him. And now he's proven me wrong. And I'm having to crawl back to God. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, God. You know, forgive me for doubting. Forgive me for not believing you, God. I'm so sorry. My dad was supposed to die. The bullet was still moving. At that time, God told me to put my hand where it was at and pray against it. And I did, and it stopped moving. My dad knew I prayed for him, and he was unconscious when I went. Don't tell me what God can't do. They still choose to live how they want to live. That's okay. I still love them. I don't, I'm not going to agree with it. I'm not going to go down there and condone it. But my point was this. God was still using me. I still had gifts. And I was still sleeping with women because I was lonely. Because, oh, a man has needs. Guess what God was telling me to do? Put your needs on hold and do what I'm asking you to do. And I couldn't do it. I was still doing the same thing when I met my wife. I couldn't forsake what I wanted. I couldn't forsake what I thought I needed for him. But when I look at the life of Christ, I see what he forsook for me. He gave his life for me. And I couldn't give up a sexual need, really, and call myself a Christian. I minister to people. I'm talking about really minister to people. Your gifts and callings, just because you're in sin, he don't snatch them back. He don't revoke them. They're still there. Stop being moved by your gifts. Stop being moved by what you think you know. And get in line with God. Get into his environment. Become a product of him. Then you'll find yourself, your whole life is about him. You will witness about him. Even if it costs you your job, you'll witness about him. If it costs you your life, you will witness about him. If it costs you a spouse, you will witness about him. If you have to forsake everything, you will witness about him. It sounds harder than it actually really is. But I promise you, this church is called Latter-day Rain Ministries for a reason. It's not just in time revelation. It's also in time blessings. But before you can get those latter blessings, 
that make your ladder greater than your beginning, you got to get in position. You got to get in that birthing position, put your legs up on the stirrup, and push. And it's going to cost you something. It's going to be painful. You're going to have birth pains. There ain't no epidural for this. It's all natural. And you got to go through all the way. It's all or nothing in God. This message is going way different than I thought. Way different. People are getting what God has for them. They come into the kingdom. They fake it till they can make it and get what God has, and they turn around and go back. I want to tell you that when you do that, a worse thing is going to come upon you. John 5 and 14. Read it in your leisure. This was a man that God healed. It says he had an infirmity for 38 years. Infirmity just means weakness. God heals him. And Jesus looks at him and said, go and sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. Stop thinking you fooling God. Stop thinking you're going to come get what God has for you and then go and live your life. It ain't going to work. Because he's going to back up and let Satan have his way. And then you're really going to be in trouble. You're really going to wish I would have just stayed where I was at. I look back at how many years I delayed my process when I left the church because I didn't want to listen to the man of God. When people get that and they go back, go over to, with me to Luke 9 and 62. And Jesus said unto him, No man, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. You are not going to come in the kingdom and, and try to get what you want from God. And you know what he's calling you to do and asking you to do. You're not going to do it. You turn around and go back. You're not fit for the kingdom. I see Christians all the time on their way to hell. And it's not me. It's just the word of God in me will not agree with their lifestyle. And I can't control it. I, I, I can't look at them, and when they start crying and stuff and getting all emotional, I can't look at them and take back what I say because it's not me doing the talking. It's the Lord. He convicts them, and then I don't never hear from them. They don't never come back to church. Oh, well. Oh, well, I did my part. I'm still lonely. I, I don't really have a friend that I can count on right now. But God, I'm going to do it your way. I'm still going to speak. They can leave me if they want. We got to get to that point. As, as Christians, we got to get there. As a professing Christian, imagine how I felt after all those things were happening around me. And that's just some of it. That wasn't all of it. That's just some of it. Imagine how I felt, a Christian. I'm a king's kid. I belong to God. Touch not my anointed and do my prophets no harm. Oh, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I think I'm doing good. Because I came, I was coming to church. God ain't that good enough? I mean, I read some scriptures here and there. God weren't that good enough? I ministered to some people. God weren't that good enough? And he would always say, nope. I require more of you. To whom much is given, much is required. People see, I've had people literally tell me what I have is intimidating. It's just stuff, man. It's four walls. It's a house. It's a car. It's just stuff. A, a, a strong storm can come and take it away. Then what? I'm going to kill myself and commit suicide because I don't have a house? I'm going to lose my soul because I don't got a car? Guess what? I got Brother Hunt's number. He'll come pick me up. Brother Hunt, I need a ride. And I'm sure he'll do it faithfully and willingly. That's what love is. We got to learn to love people, man. We can't love them to the point, though, we let them stay in sin. I love you, but I'm going to tell you the truth. And I don't care if you like it or not. Because when the truth comes out, it's not going to be me telling you. It's going to be the Holy Ghost telling you. That's what it means to be led by the Spirit of God. I don't walk around the mall and everybody, I see you, sinner, you're on your way to hell. You're smoking that cigarette, you're on the way to hell. That's not what it means to cry aloud and spare not. It's talking about when God leads you to minister to a person, then you cry aloud and spare. 
I'm not called to everybody. Even everybody that sits in this, this congregation, I'm not called to. There's certain ones in here God tells me to minister to, and there's certain ones he tells me, don't say nothing. And I can see stuff. It's about hearing him and doing it his way. That's all it is. Go over to Matthew 27 and 46. I want to show you something. And I hope it blessed your socks off. I really do. But this right here, man, is, is such a powerful scripture. Please say amen when you're there. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? I'm walking around this neighborhood with my battle axe in my hand, looking for the people who stole my property. And at the same time, I'm thinking, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Where is my stuff at, God? I was like David when they burnt Ziklag. Should I pursue? I was pursuing whether God said yeah or no. I'm going to get my stuff. And guess what? I never seen it again. Never seen it again. I want to explain to you why God turned his back on Christ just the same as he turned his back on me them years ago. As Christians, when we deem that something bad is happening to us or around us, this is how we feel. We blame God. We never looked at ourselves and asked, God, how did you back up from me? Why did you take that hedge of protection around me? for? Why? Truth be told, we don't even seek the face of God as to why, or maybe he will even tell us it's not meant for us to know why right then. See, if I, as a Christian, I'm coming to church, I pray, you know, read a little bit, Minister to some people. And then Wednesday night, me and a girl go on a date. We kiss him. We touch him. So you know lust is already in my heart. And it says if a man lusts in his heart after a woman, he's already committed adultery. So I could have been lusting after my sister in Christ. That's incest in God. We got to start seeing each other the way God looks at us. And we're all brothers and sisters. Can't be sleeping around on each other. That's not how it works in the kingdom of God. So that means I had invited Satan in, right? What's the hardest thing to get rid of? Something you invited in, right? So I invited that sin into my life, but I still expected God to do his part. How dumb does that sound? I'm not talking about I was really upset with God. Left the church, sold all my, my gospel albums. I, sold, I even sold my Bible. I, was, I said, if I'm going to hell, I'm going all the way. I want a Bentley, I want some rims on it, and I want a sound system. And I'm on my way. I felt like I was going to enjoy life because I had been kicked down so much, and I had been so unhappy and depressed for so long, I felt like I was going to do whatever I had to do to make myself happy. That was my agenda. And Pastor saw right through it. It wasn't his eyes that was looking at me. It was the eyes of God watching me. There wasn't a day went by I didn't think about Pastor and his messages and what he would say to me the whole year and a half I was gone. I went back to drinking, clubbing, sleeping around, thinking I was just making myself happy. I didn't think that was a sin to try to make yourself happy. That's how I looked at it. And that's how a lot of Christians are looking at some of the things they go, you know, you got Christian lesbians and homosexuals. But I love God. Don't you love God? The devil is a liar. You will not see the kingdom of heaven. I decree and declare it, you won't. You can't do that kind of stuff and be accepted by God. Did he still love me where I was? Of course. But he didn't accept me. When Jesus Christ was on the cross, what held him there? It wasn't the nails. It was the love of mankind. It was his love for us. He knew that while I was out sinning, one day I would come to my senses and need a savior because I didn't know how to stop. And I kept getting worse off. And then at some point I got came to my senses, just like a prodigal son, I said, I got to go back. I need him. I don't know what it is about what this man is saying from behind this pulpit, 
but I need it because I'm dying. I know I was dying. You can't tell me that a sinner don't realize it. You can't tell me that they don't know what they're doing and what's going on. And then you want me to feel sorry for you when you lose everything? I will not do it because it wasn't done for me. I had to make up my mind to do this God's way. Period. There was no other way. I, I'm telling you, I look for excuses. I've looked for loopholes just like a lawyer did. I looked through the Bible trying to find contradiction. It's not there. You won't find it. I found out that prophecy is history that hasn't happened yet. You can either believe it or not, but it's going to happen. Heaven or hell is going to happen to you at some point. It's up to you to choose which way you're going. There's no forcing or anything. He just wants to put you in a new environment. How many of you have ever said to yourself, man, I'm so sick of people lying to me, man. I can't trust nobody. I'm tired of being disappointed. I'm tired of having pain in my, in, in my, in my body. You know, headaches, back pains, foot pains. Every time I turn around, I got to take a new medicine. I got high cholesterol. It's almost impossible to eat healthy these days. They put stuff in everything. Healthy food, unhealthy, it don't matter. You better pray over it. Ask God to keep you. You know, we still have to use some wisdom and, and at least try to watch what we eat. And I'm not talking about as you're putting it in your mouth. I'm talking about watching and saying, I don't need to eat that. It's the same way in the word, man. We can't just go to every church ain't preaching the truth. You can't just go everywhere and, and just eat what you want. You got to be mindful. Hey, can you pick up the heat? <clears throat> Jesus, at that point in time, was bearing the sins of the world. Past, present, and future. Every sin, every weakness, every infirmity. God has no relationship with sin. He don't. He don't have a relationship with darkness. It's on the bottom. My. <laughs> it just says off. <laughs> uh, it'll, it'll cut off. If you, if you put it on off, it should shut itself off. Um, don't get distracted. Um, God don't have a relationship with sin. So at that point in time, he turned his back because he can't look on sin. He did the same thing when I was professing about life as a Christian. So look at this joker right here. He just think he got it all together. I'm just going to turn my back. Let him do what he want to do. We do it our way. We do it with kids sometimes. We know that they're about to go do, get in trouble and do something they shouldn't. And we'll sit there and act like we're not watching them, knowing that they're about to do it. Just to see if they're going to choose not to do it. What do you think God does with us? I must see if he's going to choose righteousness today. Or is it all about what he wants? Back then it was all about what I wanted. Yeah. Now I'm asking God, help me to want what you want for me. And I have more peace with that. I don't get everything I want. Things don't, I don't pray and just get immediate results all the time. But it's working out. And I'm trusting God. And he's asking the body of Christ to put themselves in the same situation and fulfill Matthew 6 and 33. If you seek ye first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness. I'm not even going to add that, that second part. It's not important. Don't worry about what's going to be added unto you. Don't even consider it. Don't even worry about getting the desires of your heart. Just worry about pleasing God. Don't try to please God. Just live a life that's pleasing to God. It's, it's, not, it's not that. It's not that hard. <clears throat> You know, after they, they broke in and all that stuff, I moved in fear. And 2 Timothy 1 and 7 says that God did not give us the spirit of fear, but power, love, and a sound mind. <clears throat> so at this point, I'm hurt, I'm violated, I'm angry, I'm confused about what God left me. And then pastor saying all this crazy stuff about, well, did you seek God and you know, are, are you doing it God's way? And did you give God time to respond? And I'm like, bro, really? Like, I'm emotional right now. I don't want to hear that. I don't want to hear scripture. Some of the scriptures I already knew. 
what he was saying to me was, you know the scriptures, but are you applying them? Are you practicing them? And I was not. There's a lot of people come to church, know the Bible, know scripture, know what they call to do, and won't apply it. It's like getting a cut, but not putting no ointment on it or a band-aid. It's going to get infected. And guess what you're doing? You're infected. You're infecting the body of Christ. And guess what God is about to do? He's about to remove you. And he said he's going to turn you over to a reprobate mind. That's turning you over to yourself to do as you please. And you still think God is, going, is just going to protect you. He's not. <clears throat> so <clears throat> Hebrews 4 and 15 is a very vital scripture. It says, for we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Jesus Christ knows everything that a human being can go through. There ain't nothing he's unaware of. So why do we act like he don't know where we are when we're going through we act like he's nowhere to be found. He's right here. Pick your Bible up. I guarantee you most people, when they're going through something, barely pick their Bible up. They're just waiting for some miracle to happen to change their situation. It's not going to happen. I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but it is not going to happen. That's not how God operates. Either you trust him or you don't. Either you're going to be faithful or you're not. There ain't no gray area in God. I don't know how many times we got to hear that. So I want you to also look, add to that, that was Hebrews 4 and 15, Hebrews 13 and 17. It's so important to apply this. Don't just read it. Don't just know it. Apply it. Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves. For they watch for your souls as they must give account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief. For that is unprofitable for them. I ain't getting nobody say no. That's not what it says. What does it say? It says it's not unprofitable for you. Not me. I did my part. You know, we have to watch over the souls of people. So we're in prayer. We're sacrificing what we want. I might want to go on vacation. And God said, no, I need you here to pray for this person. You ain't met them yet, but they come. But if you're out of town, guess what? I can't use you, can I? But I'm so busy chasing what I want. At that time in my life, I was not obeying the one that had rule over me. If, uh, <clears throat> I forget where it's at, but there's a scripture where it talks about there's no, ser the servant is not higher than his master. Pastor was put over me. I didn't ask for it. He didn't ask for it. That's just how it worked out. So I was supposed to be submitting myself to him. And I never took the time to really seek out why he would say some of the stuff he did. I just got mad about it and went with the way I thought. I never went to God and said, what is wrong with him? And then if I did, I wasn't sincere. I didn't really want to know. I just wanted, I was looking for God to say, you're okay. You're okay where you are. And he never said it. I waited. He wouldn't say it. Um, can you get Romans 12, 1 through 2 for me? Now, we, we heard this, uh, this, this, this scripture last week, too. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That man was already doing that. I wasn't doing it. He was doing his reasonable service. I wasn't because I thought I could see more than he could about my own life. I thought I had me in control. I was out of control. Mm -hmm. And he was trying to help me rein it in and I wouldn't listen. It says, greater love than a man that would lay down his life for his friends. John 15 and 13. He was laying down his life for me and I couldn't see. 
Um, we got to understand it's the life of a shepherd and a pastor. That's what's asked of us. But God even ask it, you know, of the flock, the sheep. We got to at least we're called to at least one soul. Everybody is. We're called to at least help one person in our life. Not make our whole life about us. Um, and I'm kind of skipping down through here because I can't read all this. <clears throat> As leaders in the body of Christ, we have to fight through hell because hell is above the atmosphere. We have to fight through hell just to get to God to get these messages. And then people throw it back in our face. They think this is so easy and it's so glamorous and it's not. I told Brother Hunt, I think it was yesterday or the day before, I wish God would have called me to be a pew brother. I just want you to sit in the pew. Don't worry about doing nothing else. And he did. I can't return this. I can't put on an RTS, return to sender. God's not going to take it back. He changed his address. <laughs> we got to fulfill what God is call, calling us to. Oh, Matthew 10 and 24 is where that scripture was where it says, the disciple is not above his master, nor the servant above his Lord. Matthew 10 and 24. I didn't realize it. I'm going to give you all this revelation God gave me of a flashlight and a battery. Um, when I was walking in sin, I was from up under the umbrella of God, which caused me to walk in darkness. And it lead, led me into an obscure life, which means unknown. It was unclear and it was uncertain because I was in darkness. So I couldn't see my way around, right? And I'm like, how can this man be in the light and see through the eyes of God and not know more about my path than I do? That's what I should have trusted in him. I should have been trusting in the God in him, not looking at him. He was the flashlight in my life that I had been seeking. And when I found it the first time, I didn't put the batteries in it. See, we are the batteries, but we are no good if we aren't put in place. Up under him was my place, and I kicked against that because it was not the environment I was used to. I was used to darkness. I wasn't used to this light and people seeing into my life. And it scared me, and it bothered me, and it made me angry because I didn't want him to see. <clears throat> I had become a product of my own environment, which was darkness, the clubbing, the drinking, the fornicating. When I left my place and my flashlight, which was this ministry and my pastor, I could not see where I was going. But God had shared with this man who I was and then allowed me to come to my senses and I realized I needed what he had gotten from God if I wanted to live. Do you know if you take a battery and you put it up on the shelf, it will die? It'll, it's just a matter of time. Anybody who claims to be a Christian or not, and you're just sitting on the shelf waiting for God, guess what? You're dying. A battery has a shelf life. We can't sit still and expect God to move. That's not how it works. I thought that was very awesome. Maybe it's just me, but that's a pretty awesome uh, revelation. Um, Romans, uh, you know, with me doing what I wanted to do and expecting God to be God in my life, God forbid. He was not. Go to, go to not now, but in your leisure, Romans 6, 1 through 2. It says, shall we continue in sin? God forbid. We shall not. And when it's not going to happen. Take it a step further. Psalm 66 and 18 says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Do you think he was listening to my prayers back then? And I'm in sin? Nope. Because I had iniquity in my heart and I knew it. I just didn't regard it. I just acted like it wasn't there. And I still expected God to move from me. I was looking for homes, jobs, cars, didn't matter. A wife. Expecting him to answer all my prayers, but I don't have to do nothing. Wrong. Let's simplify this by saying just because we don't agree with the truth does not make the truth a lie in our lives. The truth is true no matter who or what believes in it. God is on the throne no matter what people say and do with their own lives because of free will. Psalms 84 and 11 states, for the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. Key word is uprightly. We can even say walk holy. It does not say some good things. It says no good thing. Whatever is good and pure and holy, God will give unto us. 
Whatsoever we ask in his name, he is willing to bless us with. If we would just do 2 Chronicles 7, 14 through 15, it is your remedy. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Now mine eyes shall be open and my ears attend to unto the prayer that is made in this place. What prayer? The prayer is made in us. Then God will hear them. Then he will be attentive to your prayers and move for you. But if you go back, you got to repent. And you got to walk upright. To add on to what we talked about last week, because um, my time is running out, it said Abraham and Jesus forsook their natural lives to seek and find their lives in God, our Heavenly Father. Abraham would not have been as blessed and got what he did from God if he had not obeyed the voice of God, asking him to depart from his kindred. God has asked me to do the same thing, and my family don't understand it. I can't explain it to them. I just know I'm doing it his way. I don't have my kids. People keep telling me to go to the court system and fight it, and I'm not, because God keeps telling me no. That's not how he wants me to do it. People don't understand it. Oh, well, we're not meant to be understood. God told me, he said, stop being ordinary. I didn't make you an ordinary person. You're not going to be an ordinary creature. He called me, he said, I want you to be peculiar. I want people to not understand you because it makes them question. It makes them wonder, why is he the way he is? Christ died in Gethsemane to fulfill the assignment on his life to become the savior of mankind. Ananias and Sapphira, as well as Judas, sought after their natural lives first, and it cost them their souls. And for what? Money. Their love of money and not God cost them dearly. A lot of people will look at the, the, the Ananias and Sapphira when they lied to the Holy Ghost. They fell dead immediately. Ask yourself this question and see what God tells you. Where was God's mercy and grace at then? Because Jesus had already descended back to the Father. So mercy and grace was already instituted. Stop letting people make you feel like you should sugarcoat it for them. Because you're telling them the truth, but they don't like how it's packaged. Oh, you didn't tell me the right way. You didn't use the right words. I look at them and I say, so? I told you the truth. We should be able to accept the truth no matter how it comes. Because at the end of the day, even if it didn't come the right way, it was still the truth. And Jesus says, I am the truth. I'm more grateful now for our pastor more than I have ever been. And it's all because he didn't let my tears and emotions keep him from telling me the truth. And I can see now that he was used by God to save my soul and lead me into a life of truth, light, and prosperity that I would have never got without him. He cared more about me and wanted more for me than I did my own self. That's a leader. I have more peace now than ever. I have more now naturally than I've ever had. I see and hear much more clearly than ever. And for that, I will lay down my life for him in return for the life he had to lay down for me. Last week when I preached, I had a migraine. Still preach. Why? Because he asked me to. Why? So he could finally take a vacation and get a break. The man's been doing it by himself for years. When are we going to look at that and realize we need to step up and we need to help? Because we, like I said, we all have a gift and a calling. When are we going to start being responsible for what we're asked to do? I'm almost done. <clears throat> I have repented of my ways so that I may accept the ways of God. Do I always agree with it? Do I always like it? No, but I do it anyway. So now I am just super excited about what God has planned for the rest of my life. And I am sent here today to offer you all that same amazing journey with God. Maybe you're here today and you don't know God at all. Or you don't know him for yourself as you should. Or maybe you just want to repent so that you can really be saturated by him. Today is the day of your salvation and freedom in Christ Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. And I'm closing.